Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crilly. I'm back with another question and answer video. Uh, today uh, I lost electricity in the house and so what you see here is natural sunlight coming through the window. Uh, I was faced with the prospect of, of canceling my video for the week and I thought, no, the show must go on. Uh, so yes, this week's video brought to you by Natural Sunlight. Um, this drawing that I'm working on here is going to be for Mastering Manga 3. Maybe I'll see a little more about it later on, but for now, let's get on with the questions. This one, uh, this came from Gaming Base Flow, and the question is, is there a correct way to draw anime? Well, those of you who know me, you probably can predict what I'm about to say, and that is, uh, I'm going to say no, there is not one single correct or uh, incorrect way to draw uh, anime or, you know, interpreting this question to draw, to make a drawing that would be recognized as in a manga or anime style. Um, I am just not the kind of person who wants to set up walls and rules and carve things into stone about this is the way you do it, this is the way you don't do it. Um, you know, it's all a matter of opinion. I really do believe that when it comes to art. Art is not like math or science. Um, we don't have a single right answer. We don't uh, work that way. And uh, there's, you know, when I say that everything is a matter of opinion, I think we have to recognize that there is informed opinion, expert opinion, uh, and uh, the, those opinions, I would say, do maybe deserve a little more uh, attention. So that's basically what I would say. Is, th is there a right or wrong way? Some people might say, you know, if you want it to be authentic looking, then you need to do careful study of actual published manga. Uh, if that is not your concern, if you just want a little slight anime like flavor to your drawings, then you know, do as you feel. I, I don't believe that we should be sitting here um, barring people uh, from drawing in certain ways or scoffing at people. Uh, if uh, their way of drawing anime is not uh, the way that you prefer. So, anyway, my answer to that question. And before we move on to question number two, I do want to point out that um, there were like 3,000 <laughs> questions, uh, so many good ones, and uh, the reason I point that out is I know sometimes people are disappointed and they're like, man, you didn't, you never answer my question. Well, when there are 3,000 to choose from, uh, it truly is impossible for me to um, avoid hurting the feelings of a lot of people whose questions don't get answered, so please forgive me if you are among uh, those people whose uh, questions don't get answered. Let's move on to uh, number two, this one from Emily Jensen. What are your favorite drawing videos that you have made? Well, I've made hundreds of videos now. It's a little hard to choose. Um, it's like choosing between your own children. But a few of them leap to mind immediately as sort of pivotal, important videos. I think the first big really important video for me was the uh, 100 ways to draw manga eyes. Some of you out there, that might have been your first uh, video of mine that you saw. Took a very long time, probably still holds the record for the video of mine that took the longest time to do. True Confessions, it was shot over a period of days. I did not do all of those drawings in a single day. Sorry to shatter any illusions uh, with that, but it was, yeah, it's just a very time consuming process. Um, other ones, I think the, the Realism Challenge playing card, that was really my first uh, and possibly last <laughs> um, truly viral video. That one really took off. It got like 2 million views within a couple of weeks or something. Uh, and so that, um, and you know, I feel like even though that was the third Realism Challenge video that I did, it sort of solidified and, and popularized the idea of the Realism Challenge. And so that, yeah, that video means something to me. Another one, the 100 Hearts. I wonder if anyone's seen that one, uh, where the, I, did, I made a heart shape out of lots of different materials and objects. And finally, and I'm going to put links to all of these in the info box, one that I bet a lot of you have never seen is my anamorphic Coca-Cola can video. That video I put a lot of time and effort into, but it was never put on my channel. I, it was supposed to be uh, on this special Coca-Cola uh, website, in which indeed I believe it still is, uh, and you can go see it. But uh, e even if you were subscribed, if you were watching very carefully uh, every video that I ever did, you may have missed that uh, anamorphic Coke can. Looks like a 3D Coke can, but then it's revealed to be a flat piece of paper. Uh, lying on the table. So let me uh, let me make a link 
uh, to that and, and check it out. I take some pride in that one. Took an incredible effort, <laughs> I must say, <laughs> to uh, to create that one. Let's move on to the next question here from Christian Wilson. <clears throat> Uh, when creating a character, do you come up with the look of the character or the way he or she acts first? Uh, so um, that's a that's a great question. I, I just have to stop myself from saying that's a great question because I end up saying that to everything. They're all great questions, but this one is uh, interesting. You know, if you're creating a character, do you think about their design, their appearance first, or do you think about their um, the way they act or their personality? Uh, and I. Uh, not to be boring and say both, <laughs> which is pretty boring. I'd say very nearly both. I suppose in my case it starts with a design, uh, but even as you're doing the design, you're sort of thinking of the personality. Um, I think uh, in my world of creating graphic novels, the the design, the appearance of the uh, characters is always going to be uh, pretty important. Uh, but really what happens is there's a give and take as you create a, a graphic novel or a comic book story um, with, you know, you create a character, you draw, you figure out what they look like, you put them into the story, they start having uh, things happen to them or they're going on adventures or whatever, and then the personality begins to emerge. Um, and uh, as you figure out the personality, you may decide to alter the way you draw the character, you know, hopefully you haven't actually published the thing yet, you can go back and start altering, and uh, so they sort of feed back and forth to, uh, you know, uh, the process. It's not like, okay, I designed my character, that's completely set in stone now and will never ever change, and now I'm going to create the personality. At least for me, it's never uh, as clear-cut as that. There's, it's always sort of moving back and forth. Uh, question number four from Nico's Moving Castle. What is your view on the whole argument of whether a manga made in the U.S. or anywhere outside of Japan is a comic or a manga? Now, this uh, is a big uh, controversial topic, and I would say uh, some years ago it was even more controversial of people saying, you know, if you're not Japanese, you cannot call this thing that you're working on a manga. Uh, only someone who was born and raised in Japan, um, you know, and, and is having their uh, comic published in Japan, only those people are creating manga. The rest of you are creating American style comic, or, you know, American comics that have uh, some manga style aspect to them. Uh, or indeed, you know, if, you, if a French person creates a manga style comic, that you can, some people would say, you cannot call that a manga. Um, incidentally, a, a lot of people latch on to the fact that the word manga is just the Japanese word for comics. So you go to Japan and they're using the word manga in a different way. Uh, I suppose you'd have to say the correct way within the Japanese language is that it's just a, a general word for comics of all kinds. So they're going to talk about a Superman comic as, and use the word manga to describe that. I think it sort of muddies the point of this issue, though, because, you know, we can't... we. <laughs> <laughs> we are using the word manga to to characterize a style, uh, and it's a hard style to define, but you kind of know it when you see it. Uh, if we start saying, well, manga just means comics, then we get into a weird semantic place where it's hard to say, why do we even need the word manga if we're just going to use it to mean comics? Let's just keep using the word comics. Um, I, I have to take a more practical approach and say, manga this word, as used in the English language and in the, uh, many non-Japanese languages throughout the world, is being used more to characterize a style. That being said, um, I have stopped referring to my comics uh, or graphic novels as manga, um, partially just to avoid infuriating some people who get really uptight about it. Um, I think, again, it, it, it becomes semantics. It becomes just different ways of interpreting a word. Uh, but I will point out this. Uh, haiku, uh, Japanese poetry form, uh, you know, of course, it had a grand tradition in Japan. It's unquestionably invented by the Japanese, but Europeans began to write haiku, um, I believe, in the 19th century. They called them haiku. Nobody really uh, objected to it, objected to that, as far as I know. 
Um, and so I think it is, it is sort of weird that we try to build a wall around the word manga and treat it with this reverence. Um, and I think you also can start to get into a weird, slightly racist, almost, uh, way of trying to define art by way of bloodlines, you know. And so I always think, well, what if the person who wrote the book was Japanese, but the person who illustrated the book was American? What if they're both living in Tokyo, and it's published by a Japanese publisher. So we've got, we've in, inserted an American into this process. Does that suddenly mean, no, this is not a manga because it was drawn, you know? And then you start, well, what if he's half Japanese, right? What if the mother is Japanese, the father is American? Is that a half manga, you know? And, and the reason I'm asking these questions is to show how ludicrous it becomes after a point to try to define art by way of um, race. It's just a very tricky thing to do, you know. Um, and so, anyway, it is. it remains controversial. Sorry if I have upset anyone <laughs> with my uh, feeling there. I think it remains kind of an open issue, but um, interestingly, I myself have decided to stop referring to Brody's Ghost or Miki Falls as manga, uh, just because I did find that it was, you know, a lot of people found it it made them angry. <laughs> so, thanks for that question, though, um, Nico's Moving Castle. It really is a fascinating topic. I, I enjoy talking about it, actually. And um, number five, from Carol Kim. Now that Brody's Ghost is finished, are you going to work on a new uh, graphic novel? Well, you may be uh, surprised to know, somewhat stealthily, that I have actually already com completed a graphic novel since the completion of Brody's Ghost. Um, the publishers uh, don't like to say too much about a book uh, many, many, many months in, its advan in advance of its publication. So I've been holding off on talking about that book. It is a done-in-one, standalone graphic novel. And, um, yeah, I think I'd better leave it at that. Let's just say this. It is not similar to Brody's Ghost and Mickey Falls. It's quite different. And that's all I'll say about that. But you have that to look forward to. Of course, you can see me right now working on Mastering Manga 3. So that's the next one after that. And maybe I can say, in general terms, the book that comes um, after Mastering Manga 3, so we're getting quite far into the future here, but it's one that I'm very excited about. I'm going to get to do uh, an art book. It'll be just a Mark Crilly art book. Um, you heard it here first. I'm pretty sure I have not talked about that at all. Uh, and I'm really excited about working on that. That's just going to be a blast. And, um, yeah, we're st it's still quite a ways out. I don't know if we're getting to, like, probably 2017 or something like that uh, as we talk about that book. But, yes, plenty of more books coming, folks. Thank you so much for your support. And don't worry, just because uh, Brody's Ghost came to an end, that doesn't mean that I'm suddenly done uh, making graphic novels. Let's move on now to number six. Um, from Kenny LP Studios. Do you ever happen to draw something that you are proud of and attempt to redraw it, but when you do so, the redraw is nothing compared to the original? Um, yes, absolutely, that happens to me a lot. And one way in which it completely, uh, or, you know, it's very common in a way that's almost mystifying is that if I do a drawing of a, uh, a really quick thumbnail, loose sketch drawing uh, for uh, planning out a comic book, and I draw the character just really fast, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, to get, just quickly get an idea of the expression, the facial expression, very often that super loose thing that I did in seconds, that is the best facial expression. And when I go back and I try to improve on it, I actually find that it's getting worse as I stray from that original super fast sketchy version. And uh, so what I've done a lot of times is uh, I will stay very, very close to that original first sort of instinctual uh, version of the drawing, um, line by line, every single part of it, and not try to improve on it. Even though I know that it was done in truly, you know, four or five seconds. Um, so yeah, it is sort of interesting, and to me, maybe it says something about maybe your instincts just sort of taking over when you do a super quick sketch like that. Um, 
so yeah, absolutely. As uh, as uh, Kenny LP Studios said, um, do you find that re, you know when you redraw <coughs> something, it's hard to capture, recapture that magic? Absolutely, that does happen to me. So hopefully. Um, if you have been frustrated by that uh, happening to you, uh, rest assured you are not alone. I, and, and I would guess that it's a fairly common thing that happens to a lot of people, a lot of artists. Um, next question, number seven, from Rachel Salners. As a graphic novelist, how much control does your editor have over your story? And is it possible to do a story with no editor at all? Well, let's answer the second question first. Yes, it's, of course it's possible to do a, video, a, a book uh, with no editor, namely if you intend to just publish it yourself. Or you sit down with pencil and paper, you can uh, complete the entire book with no editor at all. Um, and as I said, if you're headed towards self-publication, uh, which is becoming, you know, increasingly viable these days as a way of making a living for uh, a lot of people, uh, you need never have an editor. Um, that being said, I think a, an editor is hugely important in my experience to have that extra set of eyes, somebody who, I mean, you're very close to this thing, you created this thing, you kind of need at least one pair of extra eyes to look at this and catch um, story problems or art problems that you uh, are just not seeing. So, um, I have been very grateful uh, to the editors that I've had, and um, maybe to go back to the first part of that question, um, how much control does your editor have over your story? I would say don't worry too much about an editor coming in and, um, you know, taking over your story and changing crucial, important things about it. I Only one time years ago did I have an editor that really... Uh, got under the hood, as I call it, got under the hood of the story and really started changing things around. That was the um, back in the Billy Click days. And that first book, you know, I think the editor understood that, um, that it, I was still sort of coming up with this character, and so they felt that they had the opportunity to, to change his personality. Um, from a nerdy guy into more of a cool sort of extreme sports uh, kind of a dude and so that I would say that was like the most major change that an editor uh, did on one of my books kind of did change the personality of the main character um, and yeah I was not super happy about that I'll admit that it was uh, it's a tough thing to to have um, an editor basically telling you you need to do this uh, even though it wasn't in your original vision of the story they were of course thinking of sales and you know maybe based on their uh, knowledge and experience they felt that the uh, the, the nerdy main character was not going to be so appealing or whatever anyway that is quite rare so uh, I would say that is the exception normally an editor is really helping you uh, make your story the best it can be, and I have had, uh, when you have a, a really good editor, uh, believe me, you are grateful um, for that input, and some of the ideas that they come up with are uh, fantastic. Um, okay, let's move on now to number eight, from Justin Carr. Uh, in books, not manga slash comics, do you believe that it's better to have a first-person point of view or a third-person um, now I'm going to take this question kind of like the editor. I'm going to change the question just a little bit because he wants to limit this only to books. But I also would like to talk about manga and comics, so I'm going to answer both of those. Uh, and just in case people don't know, the first person uh, point of view is when a story is told uh, f directly to the reader from a character, right? So uh, if any of you ever read like The Catcher in the Rye, that book is uh, told in the first person point of view. Everything that we read is uh, coming to us from Holden Caulfield telling us this story. And so many uh, stories and movies and are done this way. There is a narrator uh, telling you the story, uh, saying, I did this, I did that, here's what I saw on that day. That's first person point of view. Uh, third person is what we usually call this sort of omniscient, uh, uh, kind of godlike point of view, where it just says, you know, John Smith, when John Smith got into his car that morning, <laughs> you know, little did he know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, who's telling us this? The author, I guess, basically is telling us this. Um, or very often, you know, it's written in such a way that we 
kind of don't sense that there is any single person behind it. It's just sort of presenting images and scenes and kind of removing the idea of narration from it. So that would be the third person. Point of view, and so to go back finally to Justin's question, do I believe it's better to have a first person point of view? Uh, again, I'm not one to say, oh, that's better to do this, it's worse to do that, always. Um, I don't like blanket rules like that, but interestingly, in my, um, in the history of my comics, the most significant ones all have been first person point of view. Uh, going all the way back to Akiko, uh, or Akiko, I get <laughs> caught on my own pronunciation. Should it be Japanese style? Should it be American style? Um, the uh, Akiko comics, all of those uh, early stories were told in the first person point of view. And uh, when I adapted them for Random House, again, it's all first person. Uh, Akiko herself, she was telling us the story. Um, uh, and the Billy Click actually was one of the few stories that I did that was not first person, it was just the omniscient third person narrator telling the story. Um, of course, Miki falls, Miki tells us the story, Brody's ghost, Brody tells us the story. Um, I think it's just, there's an immediacy there for me when the story is told uh, by a certain person. It just, um, there is personality in the narration. It just, uh, comes more naturally to me, but certainly no, I would not say it's better to do this or it's you know, worse to do that. Uh, both ways can work. Uh, and that's why both ways exist and thrive uh, in today's marketplace. Uh, let's move on now to number nine. When drawing in perspective, uh, do you always use a ruler and uh, go and line it up perfectly to your vanishing point? Uh, this from Rand McNally. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. You know, when you see me doing these perspective uh, videos for uh, YouTube, you see me pull out the uh, the transparent ruler, and um, I'm you know always using the ruler to make the lines. Uh, so it is sort of a, a a natural question. Do you always use a ruler when you're doing uh, perspective, or do you sometimes just wing it? Uh, without a ruler, uh, and specifically do you always line the ruler up with the vanishing point, that little dot way off on the horizon, to make sure that you're getting absolutely perfect perspective? Well, uh, it kind of depends on, you know, if I'm drawing an environment uh, with uh, a floor and walls and stuff like that, almost always I will uh, go ahead and pull out the uh, the ruler. Um, my my feeling is that uh, I want I want accurate perspective. You know, the ruler is going to help me get it. So why mess around with guessing uh, at where these lines are supposed to go? Now, if I'm doing a drawing that doesn't involve so much environment, maybe let's say it's a, a kind of a close up on a character who's holding a book in his hand, and just we're we're zooming in and we see the book. And technically, it's sort of in a three-point perspective. Well, no, I'm not going to draw that book and create these points, you know, really far away so that I can pull out the ruler and make that book into absolutely um, flawless three-point perspective. In that situation, I may well uh, wing it. Uh, I find that it's really the environment uh, illustrations, and specifically the ones that have a lot of straight lines in them, you know, like if you're doing a, a forest scene, you don't probably don't need the ruler at all, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, sorry to give the boring, it depends, <laughs> answer. <laughs> but that is the accurate one uh, in this case. Um, let's move on now. This is the last of uh, the so-called serious questions. And it comes from Black Eyed Angel 94 uh, my question is this, do you think it's okay for someone who is not very creative to pursue a career in the creative field? Um, and um, that, I love that question. I don't think I've ever had a question like that before. And um, I guess it comes down to this idea of the, the creative field and to agree to what do you mean uh, in terms of um, what part you are playing in that creative field. You know, uh, someone who's in Hollywood um, could be working uh, in, in like the production side of things or the business side of things 
uh, and they are not, you know, they don't have to be good at drawing or telling stories necessarily. Um, they are, they're using their skills to play a pivotal role in helping to bring this movie together. Uh, but their skill set more is related to maybe interpersonal skills. Um, having a big, you know, Rolodex filled with names of people that uh, know you and like you and like working with you. Um, you you may uh, be in the even like the uh, accounting side of things. You know, this stuff is crucial. You can't um, get any of these things done without having uh, people uh, staffing those other positions. Um, so, I don't know if that's necessarily the answer that you wanted to hear. Uh, I suppose if you were thinking, hey, can, if a person is not creative, can they become creative enough to make a full-time living in the creative part of it? That is a, a, an open question, you know. If, uh, first of all, is there such thing as a truly uncreative person? I don't think there is. Everyone is creative to some extent. Um, but uh, if your creative abilities are such that people do not recognize them uh, in a big way, do not attach a lot of value to them, uh, I, will you be able to make a full-time living? You know, sometimes, well, you know, I said in my uh, a video not so long ago that if you have a, a skill for self-promotion, uh, that skill can be actually take you pretty far in a lot of things, but uh, you do... Yeah, you know, creativity, boy, that's pretty fundamental uh, to if you are on the creative side of things. So, anyway, hope I answered that question well. And now we are coming up to the lightning round. I hope you don't mind if I'm going to, you know, hit the pause button on the camera for a second, give myself a little bit of a break, uh, maybe even do a little time lapse to at least finish a little more of this drawing before we come back with the lightning round. Well, I got a little more work done on the drawing, and that means it's time for me to move on to the lightning round. Uh, just a word of explanation to those of you who have not watched the, this kind of video before. The lightning round is where I answer the sillier questions, the goofier, fun little questions. But uh, actually, this time, the first few are legitimate, um, you know, questions worthy of seriousness. Let's go ahead and get into the first one. This one from The One Cut. In your opinion, what two color what two colors look the best together, and what two colors clash the worst? Well, uh, immediately in terms of clashing colors, I thought of uh, green and red, the Christmas colors. Very hard to use, I find, in illustrations, just because they do call to mind Christmas so much, and so I tend to avoid that combination. In terms of colors that go well together, you know, I'm a big fan of browns, various shades of brown very muted green, uh, or a sort of um, very dark uh, form of red that's sort of like uh, burnt, brownish red kind of. I like those muted colors, and I think any two of those put together always looks really great. Moving on to number two from Herod Navid. What was the first manga series you ever read? Well, I think it was manga. It was manga. <laughs> Okay, Curly, you need more coffee. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Ranma half, or Ranma one half, as I believe Americans say, by uh, Rumiko Takahashi. Uh, always fond memories of that, one of the first um, manga series that I ever read. Let's move on now to number three from Erika Yumeko. Uh, what's the weirdest thing you've eaten but actually enjoyed? Um, when I was in Japan, I, they took me to the restaurant where they actually served a crab that was still moving. The legs were still moving. That's how fresh it was. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's it's kind of creepy, actually. It looked like something out of the movie Alien, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and yet we, they had cut it open and you were eating the crab about as fresh as it possibly could be, but it did taste good, I have to admit. Um, number four, from Neonia or Neonia Exivia. <clears throat> have you ever painted a Vermeer? If not, do you have any tips for it, please? Now, <laughs> this question cracks me up. First of all, listen to that. Have you ever painted a Vermeer? If not, do you have any tips 
for it, please. Wait, you, wait a minute. I, if I have not done it, you want me to give you tips? Don't take tips from someone who has never painted a Vermeer. And then second of all, only Vermeer can paint a Vermeer. And he died in the 17th century. <laughs> so this question just kind of blows my mind on a lot of different levels. And so I must thank you. Neonia Exivia for having asked it. Let's move on to number five. Um, shoes in the house, yes or no? This from XV Mouse VX. I think those X's and V's are being used in a decorative way. Uh, in any case, uh, absolutely no shoes allowed in this house. My wife is Japanese. That's like, Japanese women will divorce you, I'm pretty sure, if you keep the shoes on. Uh, in the house. That's, uh, that is a no-no. But actually, once you get used to it, it totally makes sense. Keeps the house so nice and clean. Uh, so let's move on now to number seven from Tyrell 676 Haggis, say the yay or nay. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. Or should I be saying that with like a really crummy Scottish Haggis, say the yay or nay. I sound like a pirate. That doesn't sound like a Scottish curly. <laughs> Please stay away from Scottish accents. Um, I'm gonna say yay because I have never tried it before and I'm really curious actually. But you know, having tried it, maybe it would be a resounding nay. <laughs> but until then, I'm gonna say yay to the haggis. Let's move on to number six. Are you a member of the WGA, also known as White Gouache Anonymous? Oh, and I'm so sorry, I uh, failed to make note of the name. Hang on, I'm going to have to get that name because it's not right to post a question without the name attribution. Okay, I'm glad I ran off to get that name because it is a really awesome name. That question comes from Bas van der Werf. Bas van der Werf, I believe, is the person who asked that question. Are you a member of the WGA, the White Gouache Anonymous? At first I was going to say, am I a member? I'm the, I'm the founder. But then I thought, no, wait a minute, that's for people who are trying to quit using white gouache, and I'm definitely not trying to quit. So no, Mr. Van der Werf, unless it's Mrs. Van der Werf, uh, or Miss. <laughs> I am not a member of the WGA. Um, let's move on now to number eight. And the question is, what color of blushies would a gray-skinned person have? Well, clearly they would have slightly darker gray blushies if they have gray skin. It depends on how subtle you want to be, you know? If you want to really go bold, you'd go for like a really good dark gray. Not me, I'm going to go for the very slightly darker gray. Um, number nine from Kyle Bryant. It's been a while since we've heard the surfer dude, Mark. What, have, have you forsaken him, man? <laughs> well, it's true. I haven't done like the surfer dude for so long. It's like, like it's always been about the uh, old man time lapse. Dude, nobody cares about old man time lapse. You gotta get back to surfer dude. I'm a little rusty, actually. I clearly need to bring him back. So my apologies. Uh, because it is, it's been a long time. I mean, I still, I occasionally break out the, uh, the Brooklyn guy. Hey, the Brooklyn guy, you haven't forgotten about me. I'm glad about it. At least that didn't happen to me like what happened to the surfer dude. Anyway, finally we come to maybe the most marvelously random question of them all. It comes from Ellie Millwood, and it is this. What happens when you run out of tacos? Well, I think what happens is you... Switch to burritos. I don't know. Maybe move to, te uh, move to uh, Texas or uh, Mexico and you will probably never run out of uh, tacos. I believe that is the answer to that question. And uh, that brings us to the end of this video. Of course, it can't be over until I add the blushies. Give her these little uh, high-tech electronic blushies. <laughs> Activate blushies. Uh, I don't know if she's supposed to be robotic or she's just wearing sort of mechanical armor. I will, I promise to work that out by the time we get to Mastering Manga 3. Uh, she's got some serious blushies going on here, though. In any case, it is almost time for me to end this video. You know that I'd never like to end, though, without thanking people who have helped me by getting the books like Brody's Ghost, 
Miki Falls, my two graphic novel series. Notice I didn't call either of them manga series. Uh, the Realism Challenge, my newest book uh, for people who are into hyper-realism. Big thanks to anyone who has got that. And finally, Mastering Manga, Mastering Manga 2. And as you can see, Mastering Manga 3 on the way. It's a while down the road. I haven't even gotten too deep into the book quite yet. But um, thank you so much to anyone who supports me by getting those books. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. But it's time for me to lay down this pencil. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back with another one real soon.